Charles Fillmore's Seven Necessary Conditions for True Prayer. When you go into the silence, have a look at it like this. Number one, God is recognized as Father Creator. Gender, gen don't worry about the gender. God is recognized as Creator. Number two, oneness with God is acknowledged. Number three, what we're talking about today, prayer must be made within in the secret place. Number four, the door must be closed on all thoughts and interests of the outer world. Number five, the one who prays must believe that he or she has received. Number six, the kingdom of God must be desired above all things and sought first. I wonder if that one should be number one. And number seven, the mind must let go of every unforgiving thought. Good morning again, everyone. Talia and I are spiritual directors. <laughs> are which sometimes uh people think is the person who runs a church or what have you but spiritual direction is actually an ancient practice that has been going on for millennia uh, mostly found uh, from the the desert mothers and fathers mystics franciscans uh, mo uh monasteries it's been going on for ages and it's essentially put simply companioning another using deep 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 holy listening the spiritual director empties themselves out so they can provide a deep, holy listening for a companion who is interested in spending some time with them, exploring what God is doing and saying in their lives. It's pretty, it's pretty simple that way. And today, we're going to be talking about some of those practices, right? Because it's difficult to really experience spiritual direction, particularly in a large group like this. It's a little bit like swimming, so it's difficult, or riding a bike, so it's pretty difficult to describe, but we can take you this morning into some of those experiences, and we title our talk, talk Turning Inward, because that's exactly where you go when you have these experiences in spiritual direction. So I'm going to invite you this morning to take a moment with me, and if you're like me, um, you probably want to take a minute and drop your shoulders from around your ears. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe relax your forehead. Uh, take your tongue off the roof of your mouth. Put both feet on the floor and kind of settle in. Go ahead and close your eyes. And I'm going to offer something to you to get us started this morning. The day is a rudderless path and still like cling to star charts, to maps, as if knowing a destination is synonymous with purpose. If the wind should steal the maps, would I rush to make them anew? I say there is a beauty in the drift, yet I keep carving new oars. I am learning to love what a day is. Sometimes I trust what is here. Amen. So poetry is one of the ways we have of uniting that inner and outer world for ourselves. And the practice or reading or writing it on a daily basis for some of us enables us to sustain that experience through all the many thresholds of maturity in a human life. Uh, David White, a mystical guy that some of you may know, um, uh, uh, mentions this recently because it's National Poetry Month. So those of you who are poets might want to embrace that. Uh, so we, as, as we look at turning inward, and if we make a segue, right, from, from that cocooning, I know, Tam, Tammy and I were like, a butterfly metaphor again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, What's your idea. But I'm going for it. I'm going for it, hon. We're doing another, <laughs> we're, doing, <laughs> we're doing another <laughs> metaphor, mostly because what I've noticed, at least, how about you, Celine, that we are, um, we're cocooning. We you are. Know, as a community, we're cocooning as a, um, as a culture right now. What's next for us after a pandemic and all of those things? And uh, it's all about that art of waiting. And one of the best places to explore that is in spiritual direction. So um, there's a book called When the Heart Waits by Sue Monk Kidd. And it is um, uh, about waiting, about her experience of, 
of cocooning as she moved into midlife and her kids were, were off to college and all of that. So I'm going to use this quote uh, that she mentions about cocooning from her book. The Greek word for soul is psyche, and it is often symbolized as a butterfly. Both the soul and the butterfly are metamorphosed. While it was tempting for me to think that the growth and emergence of my authentic self would happen with little time or effort on my part, this isn't so. <laughs> the fullness of one's soul evolves slowly. We're asked to go within to gestate the newness God is trying to form. We're asked to collaborate with grace. That doesn't mean that grace isn't a gift, nor does it mean that the deliberate process of waiting produces grace. But waiting does provide the time and space necessary for grace to happen. Spirit needs a container to pour itself into. Grace needs an arena in which to incarnate. And waiting can be a place if we allow it. And that place is liminal. It's a liminal space. And we are, you know, I'm not com are you cozy with liminal spaces? Am I comfortable with liminal spaces? No. Yeah, Most exactly. Most of the okay. time, not. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, but we're going to get there. Absolutely not. Our invitation, our invitation to you is to go ahead and get there. And Oxford just defines liminal space as occupy, occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or threshold. So I was in the liminal space between past and present. Oh, you know, one. I'm just thinking, one liminal space that I'm really comfortable with. You love that part where you're like just about to go to sleep or you're snoot. That's liminal. Okay, <laughs> that's a liminal space. What is it for you? Are you, you? trying to be, put me to sleep? <laughs> well, hey. I don't usually talk very well sitting down, but I decided that standing up the whole time wasn't going to work for me. So we're, we're yeah. talking, but I must stand up. So... Um, so what I want to talk about is another metaphor for liminal space. And to me, liminal space is like traveling through a fog. It's like I know I'm going somewhere, but I'm traveling through this fog in my life, right? Something's changed, and I'm not really sure what my footing is. I'm not really sure where I'm going. I'm not totally sure where I've been. And I don't know where the next turn is. You know when you're driving in your car in a fog? You've been there, right? And you're driving and you're driving and you know you've got a turn coming. And it's sort of thick. And you're driving slower than normal and these people are <laughs> past you and you're going, stop it. <laughs> you're making me nervous. This is that uncomfortable place, right? Where you're not sure and you're looking at every sign as you go by going, is this the place I'm supposed to turn? Well, what my belief is about liminal spaces in our lives is that sometimes I just walk into a fog. And I go, okay, here I am. I've got a life. I have to keep living. I have to wash the dishes, do the laundry, get up every day and go to work. But I don't know what any of that means. And so I just keep watching. And what I've learned is that the more time I spend inside, in me, in contemplative practices, the more available I am to the messages that tell me which way to go next. And so to me, that's what liminal space is about. And then sometimes there are those times when life just, like, turns you in a different direction, right? And you go, oh, how did I get here? And where do I go now? And I have to tell you, my life has been full of those times where I kept trying to force the next turn. Oh, I want to go this way. But does that usually work for you guys? It did never for me. I have to just sit back and wait and see, because if I force it, then I get to learn another interesting lesson that I probably didn't want to learn in the first place. Thank you very much. 
But if I just sit back and listen inside, I get way better answers. Or sometimes what I want to do, and I know this has been a few people's experience here in this church, is I want to turn around and go back where I was. Thank you. Thanks for this new turn, this adventure. It was really fun, but I want to go back where I was. I like that better. Those are those liminal space times. That's my definition of liminal space. So I look Joni? at it, yeah, I look at it more like a trapeze. But uh, so, so for uh, recent, let's just say recently for me, so I graduated from, um, yes, I'm proud of it. I graduated seminary 11 months ago. And, <laughs> and I remember someone asking me, young, this is what younger people ask you, so what are you going to do next? And I, I said, I'm going to catch up on Netflix series. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I'm gonna tend to my garden. I'm gonna rearrange all my aquariums. <laughs> They're tiny. <laughs> They're not big, so that doesn't take a lot of work. But um, and sit. This, this was the important thing that I noticed that was important for me to do alongside my spiritual director and marinate in what goes on next before I made some sort of Im- some sort of important decision, like I was. 30 years old again, and I was moving into some sort of career. I wanted to kind of sit back and see what spirit, where spirit was going to lead me. And that was 11 months ago. Still not sure. <laughs> still, still not exactly sure. I have some goals. Uh, well, Tammy and I have some big aud- audacious financial goals. We have, uh, we have a goal to catch up on Mrs. Maisel this week because we don't have anything else to, to do, finally, <laughs> all week long maybe. We have those sorts of goals. But that liminal space can some, uh, this, th- that space for me has been comfortable. I mean, that's been a comfortable, I don't have a lot to do, and that's okay. So liminal spaces are not always uncozy, of course. But when we're looking at it like the metaphor I use with the trapeze, where we are really in that state of perhaps fear, and if you're afraid of heights, this metaphor is not exactly very handy-dandy, of being in between the bars on that trapeze, you let go of one thing and you've not yet caught a hold of the other bar. And it's what Ellen Devaport calls hell in the hallway <laughs> in her book, if you're familiar with that. But we may have some in the bookstore. I didn't say I was going to mention it, so I don't know if we have any. Um, but that's what that's like. But it's not static. It's never static to sit in waiting. That opportunity, yeah, my, my work, I know Rick said, don't tell anybody what your word is for the year. So don't, don't have Rick watch this message later. Um, <laughs> but in meditation, uh, well, what, in my word I got this year was quiet. Quiet. Which is really weird for me, but... <laughs> In fact, I wasn't sure if what God was telling me was to be quiet so I could get the word, or if the word was quiet. (laughs) So I just took the word. (laughs) I took the word. And it's in that quiet, in that waiting. Again, Sue Munt Kidd tells us, the life of spirit is never static. The life of spirit is never static. We're born on one level only to find some new struggle toward wholeness gestating within. That's the sacred intent of life, of God, to move us continuously toward growth and toward recovering all that is lost and orphaned within us and restoring the divine image imprinted on our soul. And rarely do significant shifts come without a sense of our being lost in dark woods or in what T.S. Eliot called the vacant interstellar spaces. There is a self within each of us aching to be born, said theologian Alan Jones. And when this aching breaks into our lives, whether through a midlife struggle or some other crisis, we must somehow find the courage to say yes. Yes to this more real, more Christ-like self struggling to be born in that cocoon. What has happened to our idea to dwell in unknowing, to live inside a questioning, 
coexist with the tensions of uncertainty? Where is our willingness to incubate pain and let it birth something new? What has happened to patient unfolding and to endurance? These things are what form the ground of waiting. And if you look carefully, you'll see, you'll see they're also the seedbed of creativity and growth. That creativity and growth that allows us to do the daring and break through to the newness. Thomas Merton said, the imagination should be allowed a certain amount of time to browse around. Creativity flourishes not in certainty, but in questions. And again, we return back to that idea of what spiritual direction is. It's a, that's that practice of being with another person, uh, person who supports you in seeing those movements and sitting with you in those spaces so you're not so alone. It's that practice of turning within to explore what God's doing and saying, not just during the action in life, but during the moments of uncertainty and waiting. Yeah, waiting is a waiting is a sometimes a hard thing for me, and and I I know that you guys have probably heard this before, but one of the things that somewhere along the way I quit doing is praying for patience. Because what I got was that every time I prayed for patience, I got an opportunity to practice. <laughs> and um, and so, so one of the things I know about liminal space for me is, is especially if I'm in that liminal space of creativity, but it hasn't, it hasn't manifested yet. It hasn't even come to fruition. There's that part of me on that journey that knows that I'm going someplace and I can feel it. It's like I know something's coming. And I just know, right? So, so I want to tell you a story. One of the books that we read in the Spiritual Direction Program that I'm going to graduate from in June um, is... <laughs> thank you. I'm really excited about that. Um, we read a book called Hope Will Find You. And I encourage you to, to just get a copy of it anytime you can. It's a lovely little book. I bought it on Kindle. It's, it's 54 or 55 chapters that are like three, three pages each. And each little chapter is like filled with inspiration. It's just amazing. But it's about, this, uh, about a woman. Um, she's she's a, a young woman rabbi. And she has a, she has a family. And she's going along with her with her career that was a dream from the time she was like six or something like that. And she's, she's going forward with her dream and she suddenly finds out that her child has a debilitating condition that may actually be progressive and eventually kill her. And her whole world stops. And you can, those of you who are moms can imagine what that's like. It's like, she just shut down and turned everything in her life to her child um, and, you know, was experiencing fear. And this little book is like her story of, of getting her life back and still taking care of her child. It's like that learning to move from I'm an independent adult woman with a family to I'm a mom still looking for my dreams while I take care of my disabled child. And so it's a really sweet, sweet story. And she had gone along for years, I think, um, I can't remember exactly during what, what age her child was at this time, but she had given up her, her career. She was basically spending most of her time in waiting rooms and doctor's offices. She learned tons from all of that. Um, but she was with a friend who looked at her and said, do you miss it? And that was one of those messages from God that came to her that put her a step back on her path. That's those things that come to us in the, in the silence, but in the real world, because we've opened to them in our lives. And from that, she shared that, 
that, well, no, I don't miss all of it, but it, there are things I miss. And what she missed most was praying with people on Friday night as the sun set for the Sabbath. And that it was magic, and she got to spread the magic. And in that, she got that little piece of inspiration that took her, she had been driving past this this church, just regular church, that was open to Jewish people having services in it or something. And she decided to stop and talk to the minister and set up a thing and actually started doing Sabbath services. And they created a group where she could share and, and re, rekindle part of her dream. And so it was really wonderful. Th and that was early in the book, actually. That was somewhere middle of the way through. And one of the things she said was, I unlocked doors I never knew would open. So just consider the doors that you wondered might not ever open. Later on in the book... Um, her daughter was old enough to begin her studies for her bar mitzvah. And, um, and I know I don't pronounce that right, but oh well. It's a bar, is it a bat mitzvah bat for mitzvah. a girl? Yeah, for, girl, for girls. And Noah, um, Noah is her daughter's name. And, and the woman that wrote the book's name is Na Naomi Levi. And um, Noah was ready to start studying, but Naomi was uh, scared to start teaching her because of her disabilities, and she has some disabilities with reading and different things like that, and she was just, mom was nervous about it. And here are Noah's words. If you don't feel happy, just wait, because you're going to be very happy soon. Just wait, because your life is going to be bigger and more filled with joy. Someone will always be with you, even though the world may change and so many things may happen. You will always have God with you no matter what. Maybe God is telling us that if, we don't, if you don't like your life, if you'll really try to enjoy life, you'll find hope. No, hope will find you. Sometimes I feel sad and start crying for no reason. I think God is saying that someday I will find a way to be happy again. I just feel when I look at people who don't have disabilities, who are really put together, I feel sad that I'm not that person. But then I realize that I'm special in my own way. No one else can compare to me. I have a life that no one else can ever have because I'm my own person and I live my own life. After hearing that, Naomi's friend Toba said, Noah's more capable than you know. Start teaching her and you'll see. The bald angel said, she's something special. Noah said, hope will find you. I gasped. These are Naomi's words. I gasped when Noah said, hope will find you. I'd been trying to hold on to hope for so long, to grasp at every little sign of improvement, of good news, like it was the happy ending of this long wait. Anybody ever felt that way? I had spent so much time searching for hope, but my child was telling me I didn't need to push so hard or hang on so desperately. Noah was telling me to relax and let hope in. Like a kind of grace, hope will find you. And I'm going to take a minute here because at the end of the book, after the bat mitzvah, and she did it all, Noah did it all perfectly on her own and gave this beautiful talk about how we have to accept people for who they are. 
Naomi talked about what she had learned through this liminal space of seven, eight years, something like that. She says, I've learned about fear and faith and love and perseverance and luck and friendship and family. I've learned about falling and rising and shining. I've dreamed of a heaven and found it here in luminous, ordinary days. Yes, the moon is in the ocean. Yes, I've learned many lessons from the waiting room that you can find grace in the wilderness. I've learned about God and angels and prophets and patience. I've learned that this very day the, is the only day I've got, perfect or not. It belongs to me, and my real life isn't somewhere off in the future. It's right here with the chickens and the goats. I've learned that a good push is a great thing, and that when you do just one thing, many surprising, surprising things can start. I've learned about laughter and courage and dreaming. And I've learned about stillness. She goes on and tells many more things that she learned. But she learned about stillness. And that's one of the things that we're going to do some practice of later today. Hope will find you. So I'm going to invite you to enter into something that we spiritual directors actually are here to hold you accountable for. And that is your own practices. The practices that we said, what did you say the other day that unity people actually, we talk about being in the silence, but we can oh. do it for about <laughs> 90 seconds. I mean, statistically, yeah. that's about what we can do. And we're going to invite, I'm going to invite you to do that, to allow you to settle in on what has resonated for you or marinated for you, to consider how hope has found you or will find you, where you are in this liminal space right now. We'll do that for a minute before we move on. When you're ready, come on back to the room. One of the practices um, that I want to include today in terms of, and Therlene will go into more of these, but I wanted to include this particular practice today because first it resonated with me, second it's Char Charles Fillmore, and third we're in a Unity Church. So um, I do want to share with you, and I hadn't seen this until I'd done a little research, on Charles Fillmore's seven necessary conditions for true prayer. I may be giving myself away. Everybody else in the room may have seen these. <laughs> <laughs> I had never seen them before okay. you shared them with me. So first, when you go into the silence, have a look at it like this. Number one, God is recognized as Father Creator. Gender. Gen don't worry about that. God is recognized as Creator. Number two, oneness with God is acknowledged. Number three, what we're talking about today, prayer must be made within in the secret place. Number four, the door must be closed on all thoughts and interests of the outer world. Number five, the one who prays must believe that he or she has received. Number six, the kingdom of God must be desired above all things and sought first. I wonder if that one should be number one. <laughs> And number seven, the mind must let go of every unforgiving thought. Aren't those awesome? <laughs> Aren't those awesome? I just love that. I'm sure I've heard them before but because they sound so familiar, but I don't remember that I heard them in those, in those ways. So one of the things we want to talk about is practices. And so how many of you guys meditate on a regular basis? Yay, good for you. Awesome. 
So that's a great practice. Prayer, I'm a prayer chaplain here at the church. Prayer is a great contemplative practice. A lot of these are practices that we, that we teach and we use and we invite people to, into in spiritual direction. Um, some of the others that you may, not, you may not think are contemplative practices are walks in nature, art, singing, laughter. In fact, I had a teacher once that said, laughter is a sign that God is present. In fact, I loved, we did a thing in, in our class about laughter yoga. It was great fun. Um, there are all kinds of breath work that you can do. Just call out if you have something that hasn't been mentioned. Yoga. Journaling. Dance. Gar da yes, gardening. <laughs> gardening. Okay, that's not one of mine. Thank that's, you very much. That's pretty Let's <laughs> just work yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Running. Yes. Music, any kind of music. Swimming. Wow. I had never thought of that one. That's great. Yeah. Exactly. Anything you do mindfully. I have a friend who does these little color bead art things. And that's her and that's her contemplative practice. Um, there are just all kinds of things. Anything that takes you into that place where you commune with God inside of yourself, where you're aware. Those are contemplative practices. And so, we're going to bring our little talk to a close here. Um, and um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do some affirmations, because affirmations are also a great who practice. Does, yes, who does affirmations and denials as a spiritual practice? There you go. Yay. <laughs> exactly. Yay. Awesome. Yeah, we're going a little old school today, doing some affirmations. We got the eye onto the sparrow, that classic, <laughs> classic music, and some classic uh, affirmations here. Uh, so, I'll, we'll say them first, you say them after us. <laughs> This is one of my favorites. I can't wait. I know. I know. That's why I'm sitting here letting you do it. Go ahead. I am more resilient than I realize. Same. I am I'm more resilient, resilient than, than I, I realize. realize. And this is my favorite. <laughs> Guided intuitively, I trust my inner wisdom that all is well. Guided, Guided intuitively, intuitively, I trust, I trust my, my inner wisdom, wisdom that, that all, all is well. well. And finally, centered in God, I am secure and peaceful. Centered in God, I am secure and peaceful. And finally, I invite you to settle in one more time and have a listen to everybody's secular, secular slash religious poet, Mary Oliver. Today, I'm flying low and I'm not saying a word. I'm letting all of the voodoos of ambition sleep. The world goes on as it must, the bees in the garden rumbling a little, the fish leaping, the gnats getting eaten, and so forth. But I'm taking the day off, quiet as a feather. I hardly move, though really, I'm traveling a terrific distance. Stillness one of the doors into the temple. Amen. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I circulate, and I am grateful.